do we understand the world around us? With our brain, of course. But also with our hands. We fabricate. Children endlessly build, destroy, assemble to make sense of forces, of objects, of people. To understand boats and water, they take wooden sticks and they throw them in rivers. Scientists do the same. To understand ocean waves, they build giant aquariums in their labs. To understand the formation of spiral galaxies, they build computer simulations. What if we want to understand ourselves? What if we want to understand things like emotions, learning, curiosity? Again, we need to fabricate. We can fabricate baby robots and provide them with mechanisms and models of the brain, of the body, of learning, and change them and experiment them systematically to see what's happening. And we can compare the behavior we observe with the mechanism inside, since we designed it. And this can be illuminating. Let me give you a first example. That's about understanding the role of curiosity in child development. Children learn so many things, but they do so in a very progressive way, with a specific timing and ordering. For example, before they learn to walk with their two legs, they first learn how to control their neck, then how to roll on their belly, then how to sit, how to stand up, how to walk on the wall with their, with their hands on the walls. Why? and how do they follow such a progression. Of course, the social environment plays a big role. But there is another force which drives all of us, and this is curiosity. Curiosity which pushes us to discover, to learn, to invent. Psychology and neuroscience I've long understood that the brain likes to explore novel activities for their own sake. But we still understand very little about curiosity. So with my team, we tried to improve this. We fabricated. We fabricated robots that learn, that discover, that set their own goals. We fabricated the playground experiment, for example. Let's look at the video. Here we see a baby robot that is learning and making experiments to make sense of the world around it. He tries actions, he observes the effects, and it tries to detect irregularities along those actions and effects. And it allows it to make predictions. And the way it chooses those experiments, those actions, is like a little scientist. It chooses experiments that he thinks will provide a lot of progress in its predictions, that will provide new information. And we observe that not only it leads robots to acquire novel skills at their own initiative, like, for example, learning how to grasp an object in front of them, but we also observed a spontaneous evolution and self-organization of its behavior, with a progressive increase in complexity. We observe the emergence of cognitive stages, which were not pre-programmed by the engineer. For example, in the end, the robot ends up having systematic vocal interaction with the other robot. And this was not pre-programmed by the engineer. This is actually the result of the dynamic interaction between learning, curiosity, its body, and the environment. And the body itself is very important. If you change the body, you keep the same learning mechanism, then we, you will see different cognitive stages emerge in a different order. Let's turn 
to a second example. What is the origins of languages? How can a community of individuals agree on a shared system of sounds, a shared system of words, a shared system of concepts? This is what we explored and studied in the Ergo Robot experiment, which we showed recently at Fondation Cartier pour l'Art Contemporain in Paris, and which was also for us an opportunity to share our activities with the general public. And this was also a collaboration with artist and movie maker David Lynch, who did the scenography, as you will see. Let's look at the video. Here we see five little robots. They have the same learning mechanism with curiosity I just presented. But in addition, they have mechanisms that allow them to invent their own language, their own system of words to speak of the world around them by playing simple language games, something that was invented by a great researcher called Luc Stills. Here we just saw such a language game. One robot shows an object to the other one, and he says how he calls it. Then the other robot does the same. And then they update their vocabulary. Initially, they don't share a language. They have a different vocabulary. It's a big mess, a lot of misunderstanding. But progressively, their language converges, crystallizes, and the whole population of robots shares the same language, and it is their own language. If you run again the experiment, then they will invent another language that cannot be predicted by the engineer who built the robots. Again, here, the body is very important. If you have robots that have, for example, rich tactile sensors and poor visual cap capabilities, then their language will develop in such a way that you will have a lot of words to speak about touch and little words to speak about colors. This leads us to a quite important question. Could we consider the body as an experimental variable, thanks to robotics, something that you can change and experiment systematically? With animals and humans, it's obviously difficult. Can you imagine what it makes to put the body of a mouse around the brain of a snake? Of course, complicated. But with robots. Until quite recently, it was actually also very difficult, because making a robot involved heavy manufacturing techniques, a lot of engineers, and it took a long time to build a robot, and when you built it, you didn't want to change it because it was too complicated. But this is beginning to change, thanks to something that is now revolutionizing design and manufacturing, and that is 3D printing. A 3D printer is a machine which can literally print any object, any shape, in three dimensions, with many kinds of materials, and just based on the 3D drawing you make on your own personal computer. And with my team at Inria Flowers, we decided to take this to humanoid robots. You want to change and explore another shape for the head, for the hand, for the legs. In one afternoon, you make a drawing. The day after, you print and right away you assemble and you experiment. And this led us to design the poppy humanoid robot, which skeleton in white here is entirely 3D printed. Initially, this robot was targeted to explore and study the role of morphology upon biped locomotion and human-robot interaction. For example, here you see two alternative shapes for the legs, which make it more or less easy to control balance. Let's look at a video of the poppy robot. 3D printing actually allows unbelievable creativity and productivity. Beforehand, you needed whole teams of engineers to build such a robot, and many shapes were impossible. With 3D printing, those shapes are now very easy to build, and you only need a handful of people 
In my team, for example, it was made especially by Mathieu Lapère, the main architect of the robot, and Pierre Wanet, who did the software. And in addition to 3D printing, the robot is also open source. And openness is just as crucial as 3D printing. Open source means that everyone can download from the web the source files of the mechanics and of the software so that anyone can rebuild, improve, and hack the robot for one's own project. So every scientist in its lab, every engineer in its company, every student at school, every artist, every geek in its garage can rebuild the robot, can build on the great ideas of, of others and share again its own ideas. This multiplies creativity through social sharing and social innovation. Openness also allows everyone to look at every detail inside. If you look at the kinds of experiments with baby robots I talked before, their full explanatory power only becomes alive when everyone can look at every detail inside. So I just let you look at the end of the video. Just a couple of months after we announced the open source release of, of this humanoid robot, we have already more than a hundred institutions, labs, fab labs, geeks in the garage, students in their schools, in their universities, who are already reusing and adapting the robots to their own projects and sharing their ideas on the website we created for this robot. And we can expect that in a few months, we will see a wild ecology of offsprings appearing of this, on this website. A robot based on Poppy with maybe four legs, eight arms, wheels, or maybe propellers that could allow him to fly. Why not? We are ahead of a fascinating and creative set of new experimentation that are now possible. And if we come back to the experiments and questions I talked at the beginning, it means that now everyone, each of you in your home, in your company, in your university, each of you will be able to fabricate and to understand better things like emotions, learning, and curiosity. Thank you very much.